I don't, I don't know if I've ever preached, had a 20 minute break and preached again, right? <laughs> so, uh, excuse me if, if some of my thoughts may overlap from what we uh, said just a moment ago, and uh, so we're going to do our best not to overlap. I do need to uh, uh, finish one thing that I was stating a moment ago and to give my apologies. I, I was told uh, when the service was over a moment ago that I had said something about the United States Army, but I failed to recognize that there was Navy and Air Force and Marines <laughs> here as well. And uh, so I just want to make sure that I give a shout out to all the branches of the military. And uh, as one gentleman told me standing out there, he said, we're all on the same team, right? We're just different branches. But I, I can't say thank you enough uh, to you guys for all your hard work and dedication uh, to serve in our country. Like I said, the last uh, service, it, it, it means the world to me because of what you do. I have the freedom to do what I do. And uh, guys, it's just uh, forever will be uh, indebted and forever grateful for your service to this country. Now, I also want to say that I, I in my haste to, uh, you know, finish the, the, the message a moment ago, I forgot to mention that my friend Robin, he and his wife, uh, he did take the fight to the enemy and they are together today. Praise God. And uh, they are doing well. Matter of fact, I just saw them both uh, on a Facebook post yesterday that they're down in Houston serving the Lord Jesus there right now in the midst of flood relief. And uh, so if he's watching on that video, I just want to make sure that he knows that I didn't just throw him under the bus and leave it there. Uh, he, he didn't take control. Anyway, I uh, do appreciate the worship, man. It's been so good to worship with you guys and so good to worship uh, with my brother Willie. Uh, over the last few days, and it, it's just always a blessing for me to be able to do that. When we were little boys, um, Willie was different than all the other kids. Um, he, he, uh, all the other boys, Willie liked to play the piano, and he liked to sing, and he liked to practice his music. And so we'd all be outside playing football, baseball, softball, and golf, and we'd hear that music banging away up in the room upstairs. And, uh, you know, I used to make fun of him and say, oh, you know, he ought to be more manly, and he ought to be out here playing the sports with us. But now I wish I had his talent. And uh, so it's amazing to listen to him and, and what he does. And so uh, we're going to just dive right back into the Word of God uh, this, set, this morning. And if you want to turn in your Bibles today, we'll be to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter number 17. The book of 1 Samuel, chapter number 17. And, and I want you guys to know this, um, that I sincerely pray over each and every message that I would bring to you this week. And so... I did not come to Korea with um, a list of messages that I've preached in the past and just pulled out good ones in order to give to you. Every message that you're hearing me preach this weekend is brand new. And uh, so these things are, are, are new to me. You're hearing them for the first time and they're fresh in my heart and mind. And so I just want you to know that this isn't just, I'm not just a professional preacher that just gets up and just preaches to make you feel good or to make you feel something or to get a reaction out of you. I'm truly seeking the Spirit of God. And so I want you to hear that. And I want to segue that into saying to the chaplains who are here today, um, I know that after this we're going to be breaking out into small groups and you're waiting on some questions for me to give to you in order to lead those breakout sessions. I'm waiting on God to give them to me. And I was just praying a moment ago, God, if you give them to me like now, because I need them like right now before this is over. And uh, so we're, we're, we're praying that before this is over, God's going to give me those questions. But I want to say this to you. I will give you some questions or some sort of challenges to speak about uh, in the breakout sessions as God gives them to me during this time. But what I want to say to you is when you get into that room, chaplains, you just let the Holy Spirit guide you more than anything. I'm going to give you something, but let him take control. If you feel led to go another way or, or the conversation dictates something else, don't you worry about the challenges. You just go with what God leads. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we're going to look at 1 Samuel 17 uh, this morning, and we're going to start by reading one verse of Scripture, verse number 50, a very familiar story to all of you today. So we're going to look at 1 Samuel 17, verse number 50. David, that, 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 that name just resonates with us, doesn't it? King David. This is before he's the king, of course, but David defeated the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Even though David had no sword, he struck down the Philistine and he killed him. If I were to ask you this morning, who do you think of 
When I ask, when I say to you, who is a godly man? Who, who comes into your mind when you think of a godly man? I mean, for me, the very first person that comes into my mind is the Reverend Billy Graham. Everybody in this room knows who Billy Graham is. He's 98 years old. He has lived his life for the cause of Christ. And, and in all reality, if Billy Graham died right now, no one on earth would be able to say a negative thing about him. He's never been involved in a scandal. He's never been involved in, in an uproar. He's never fallen from grace. Billy Graham has endured to the very end of his life. Who's a godly man? Billy Graham is a godly man. I think of another man named Dr. Don Wilton. I don't know if you've ever heard of Dr. Wilton. He's the pastor of First Baptist Church, Spartanburg, South Carolina. And Dr. Wilton is Billy Graham's personal pastor. He goes and spends every Thursday with Billy Graham. And they sit and they talk to one another and he converses with him and he's mentored by him. Well, Dr. Wilton is a personal mentor of mine, and so I'm able to sit under his feet. Dr. Wilton is a godly man. I told him recently, I said, his first name was Don. I said, Don, I want you to know that I have learned more watching you walk than I've ever learned hearing you preach. And I've heard the man preach a hundred times. He's a godly man. When I think about a godly man, I, I think about my Papa William. My daddy's dad. Mine and Willie's grandfather. I mean, he is, a, he is as true and as godly of a man as you'd ever want to meet. I think about the days when I was living in sin and, and a drug addict, and I didn't know this was going on at the time, but my grandmother would tell me later that he would wake up in the middle of the night at like 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning, and he would wake her up, and he would say, Roberta, we've got to pray for Zach. God's prompted me to pray for him. And she says that my grandfather would get out of the bed, and at the time he was in his mid-70s, he's now in his 80s, but he's in his mid-70s, and he would get down on his knees on that hardwood floor, and he would pray until the sun came up. Just for me. And today, every time I preach, my, my Paul Paul William is sitting over to my left. He always goes wherever I go. He's not here today. I saw some of y'all looking to see if he's there. He's not here. He didn't fly me to Korea. He's afraid of airplanes. But he always sits over to my left. And as I preach, that man sits over there and weeps over the very word of God. I mean, if, if he were here today and I was quoting Genesis 1-1 and I said just in, the word in, he weeps. He loves the word of God. He's a godly man. When we look at the Bible, we think of godly men. And one of the men that comes to the forefront of our mind is this man named David. I mean, we know that the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel 13, David is a man after God's own heart. Now, the reason I love the story of David is this. We can all resonate with David. The Bible says he's a man after God's own heart, but we know that David failed God miserably in his life. Yet God showed him grace. It proves to me that, that although I'm a complete and utter failure, and many things I make, many times I make a mess of the things of God, he still has grace and mercy on me. So in this session, I want us to take a look at what makes a godly man. And I really want us to uncover, if you will, the characteristics of a spiritual warrior. Because David was a warrior, right? I mean, we know this. In, in 1 Samuel chapter number 16, we see verse number 18. One of the young men answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre, and he is a valiant man, a warrior, eloquent, handsome, and the Lord is with him. So what makes a spiritual warrior? What are the characteristics of this warrior? What makes a godly man. Number one, I believe that David was a man of great fascination. David was a man of great fascination. Now, what do I mean by this? We know that David from the scriptures, when he's standing at this battlefield, David said, or Saul says to him, David, you can't go fight the giant because you're only a youth. 
So we don't know how old David was at this time, but we imagine that he was somewhere between probably the age of 10 and the age of 18 years old. So he's a young man. And we know that young boys, young men, pastor, are often fascinated with the things of life. My brother Willie was like this growing up. Willie was always fascinated with how things work. So I remember when I was six years old, my parents bought me a bike for my birthday. And, and my bike was green, and it had white tires, right? I was the only kid on the block that had white tires on my bicycle. And I thought those white tires were the coolest thing in the world. Well, I had about that bike about two weeks, and I come home one day, and my bike is missing. And I'm looking for my bike, trying to find my bike. I don't know where my bike is, and when I finally find it, guess what? It's been taken completely apart, and Willie's trying to make a helicopter out of my bike tire. <laughs> and the bad thing is, my Popo Williams, who I said is a godly man, is the one who told him he could do it. I mean, I think about little boys and how they're, they're often fascinated with the things of life. I think about when Willie and I were little boys, and, and, and we had some cousins of ours, uh, Josh and Benjamin and Jonathan, and we were, all, we were all around the same age, and we were kind of always together. And I remember, Willie, remember this one Easter, I had this brand new blue suit on that I loved. It was light blue. I mean, this is the 1980s, right? 86. A, a light blue suit. I probably even had those high white socks on, probably. You remember those pictures that you see when you were a little boy? But we go to my mama's house for, for Easter dinner, and I remember all of us boys, we go down the hill to my papa's shop. And we walk in there, we find a green spray paint can. And I don't know if it was Willie or Josh or Benjamin, but one of them began to shake that thing and say, hey, there's a marble in there. And we got to get that marble out of that can. <laughs> and so we take that can outside. There's an old stump there. They take that can, they lay it up there. So Willie takes the sledgehammer and he hits it. Nothing happens. Josh takes the sledgehammer and he hits it. Nothing happens. I do it. Nothing happens. You think at this moment that this is God, right? Giving us that open door to get away from temptation. Jonathan hits it. Nothing happens. Benjamin says, I'll show you how to do it. And he takes that sledgehammer and he comes back like, oh, I remember Gallagher and the sledge matic right? He comes back with that thing like the sledge matic and he drops it. Wham! And when he does, right? Spray paint can shoots all over us. We're covered in green spray paint. And we walk back in the house, Right? All of us were abused that day. I right? just put it to you like that. But young men are often filled with fascination. And David was a man who was filled with fascination. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 16 through number 21. The Bible says, Every morning and evening for 40 days, the Philistine came forward and he took his stand. And one day Jesse told his son David, Take this half a bushel of roasted grain along with these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. And also take these ten portions of cheese to the field commander. Check on the welfare of your brothers and bring a confirmation for them. They are with Saul and the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting the Philistines. So David got up early in the morning. He left the flock with someone to keep it loaded up. And he set out as Jesse had instructed him. He arrived at the perimeter of the camp as the army was marching out to his battle formation, shouting their battle cry. Israel and the Philistines lined up in battle formation facing each other. What's David do? David leaves the supplies in the care of the quartermaster, and he runs to the battle line. So here's this young man. He's not even really a soldier. He's coming down there to bring the goods. But when he hears the battle cry, right, as a young man, he leaves it all behind. Why? He wants to get down there to inquire, to see what's going on. He's filled with fascination. We see this as we go further, verse 25 through verse 27. Previously, an Israelite man had declared, do you see this man who keeps coming out? He comes to defy Israel. The king will make the man who kills him very rich and will give him his daughter. The king will also make the household of that man's father exempt from paying taxes in Israel. And David, he obviously hears the conversation, so he is a man of fascination. He goes a little bit deeper. David spoke to the man. So what will be done for the man who kills that Philistine and removes his disgrace from Israel? So once again, we see this fascination filling his heart. And go down to verse 28 through verse number 20. So now David's on the front of the battle line, and David's oldest brother, Eliab, listened as David was speaking to the man, and he became angry with David. And he said, why did you come down here? Who did you leave those few sheep for? 
or she within the wilderness. I know your arrogance. I know your evil heart. You just came down here to see the battle. So even his oldest brother realizes, right, that David is a man of fascination, a man who's wanting to know how things work. He's wanting to pull things apart to see what's deeper. Now, friends, I want to tell you, fascination is not always a bad thing. Because this fascination in David's heart also led him to a worship-filled heart. This fascination in David's heart also led him to a love for the God of heaven. You see, David was a shepherd boy, the Bible tells us. And it is my belief that David is so filled with, with wonder and so filled with the awe of the glory of God that as he sits out there on the hills, the Bible is filled with what we know as the Psalms. 150 Psalms have been written. 73 are attributed to this young man named David. And those Psalms, if you go read the Psalms of David, they're all filled with wonder and worship for the very glory of God. 3,600 songs in the Jewish hymn book today are attributed to David. So on top of the 73, he wrote 3,600 more that we know of songs of worship and praise. Go with me to Psalm 150. I just want to read one of these to you this morning so that you will know the type of heart that David had. Psalm 150, the very last psalm that we find in Scripture. Here David writes, Hallelujah. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his powerful acts. Praise him for his abundant greatness. Praise him with trumpet blast. Praise him with harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with flute and strings. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. David says, praise God with all that you have, with all that you are. Give it all to him. I think about David as we remember in 2 Samuel, there's that moment in time where the Ark of the Covenant has been captured and they're bringing it back to Jerusalem. And the Bible says that David assembled the sacrifice and as they're marching that Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem, it says that David danced with all of his might in front of the Ark. And I think about in my mind, this little boy down in Great Falls that I used to pastor, his name was, we called him Junebug. His real name was Montel. And Junebug didn't have a lot. Friends, I'll just tell you, Junebug lived in, in the worst poverty you could ever imagine. And, and, but little Junebug, he had always come to church on Sunday morning. And I remember this one day. He was sitting beside me, and the music got to play. And old Junebug got to jig. You know what I mean? And he got to dancing up in front of everybody. He was just worshiping Jesus. Somebody behind me hit me in the shoulder and said, tell that boy to stop. I couldn't tell that little boy to stop. He was filled with awe. He was filled with wonder. He was filled with worship over the God of heaven. What I wish is that more people would do a jig before the Lord. Because what's it say in Psalm 150? David says in verse 8, let everything that breathes Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I've often wondered what it would be like if we reversed that verse and we said it like this. Let everything that has breath or let everything that praises the Lord have breath. Would you have breath this morning? Because are you praising the Lord? I mean, a moment ago, my brother Willie is singing songs of worship. He's having to beg you to sing louder. You see, unfortunately, for whatever reason, men, we have a hard time worshiping. And I think it comes back to this point of, of, of pride. Because for, for men, we, we don't like to have to, we like to do things on our own. We don't like to have to rely completely on another. This is why 
I think it's easier, scripturally speaking, it seems like it's easier for women to follow the Lord. If you look at the cross of Calvary, right, Jesus is there. All the disciples are gone, but the Bible says, but the women who ministered to him followed him all the way to the cross. Women are much more prone just to give it over, but, but men were filled with pride, and we like to think that we can do it all on our own. And so we don't have a need for God because I can do it on my own in my pride. And so when we come to the house of God, a lot of times we stand there looking like we're sucking on sour grapes. When the Lord God of heaven has done everything for us, men. He's given us his son, Jesus. He has shed his precious blood on the cross of Calvary. He's resurrected that you might have eternal life. He's given you everything. How can you not give him everything? Everything in return. Friends, listen, I make it my goal every time I come to the house of God to out-worship you. Not so that I can get the glory. No, it's because I want God in heaven to know that I love you and adore you more than anybody else. And I'm not ashamed to worship him. But unfortunately for men, sometimes we don't worship. I mean, you know, the, the, there's all those different worship poses that you see in the church, right? There's the, there's the, the behind the back, and then there's the, the hands like this, right? And then there's the one hand, and then there's the one hand, and then there's the two hands, and, and then there's that charismatic guy, you know, that's spinning and all these things. <laughs> but let's think about it. Many of us are just afraid to worship. And I'm going to say something to you, and I don't, I don't want you to hear this wrong, because I know your heart. But we, we, get, we get it so messed up in the church today. We come to church, to the church house, and we say, I've come to get my blessing. Now, now friends, listen to me. I, I know your heart on that. You're coming to learn. You're coming to, you're coming to, to enjoy come into fellowships. Don't hear me wrong. I understand your heart behind that. But because we come to get, we forget to give. And worship is the giving of our heart for the glory of God. David was a man filled with fascination. The godly man, the spiritual warrior, will also be a man filled with fascination. Secondly, the spiritual warrior, the godly man, will be a god Fearing man. I was wondering, does any man in here have a life verse? You know what I'm talking about when I say a life verse. A life verse is that, that verse that you just kind of you just kind of live by, right? So we think about Tim Tebow. Everybody in here knows Tim Tebow. We think about Tim Tebow and, and we think about when he played at Florida, right? How Tim Tebow would put those 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 uh, stripes below his eyes and underneath his eyes he'd have what John 316 written across them, right? Which that's also my life verse because the verse that that I was saved by. So, so John 3, 16 for me is my life first. Some men in this room, I can guarantee you that if you said your life first, it'd probably be Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. I mean, that's a powerful verse. Some others would, would probably be from the book of Matthew, and you would say something like this, my, my life first is follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. I mean, I love to hear your life verse. I think it's imperative that you have something like that that you can resonate with, that you can cling to, that you can hold on to. And I think for David, if he had a life verse that he could have tattooed on his arm, it would probably be Matthew 10 in verse 28. There Jesus said the following words, Do not fear man who can kill the body, but not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body. And cast it into hell. David was a man of fascination, but David was a God fearing man. When you look at the story of David and Goliath, you might fall under the presumption that David was a man who had no fear. It's not the case. It's just that David's fear wasn't misplaced. David didn't fear man. Instead, he had a fear of God. 
And so I want you to look with me in 1 Samuel chapter number 17. And we're going to just look at some things here about this one point. He had a fear of God. Now let me just remind you when we read the Bible, and, we, and, and you remember this in your own life, when you're reading the Bible, and you're reading verse by verse in the Bible, what you'll find is that each verse, this is true across the board, every verse in the Bible has only one meaning. So you can't take 1 Samuel 17, verse 1, and say it means 10 different things. It can only mean one thing. Now, it might be applied in many different ways. There's only one meaning. And so let me tell you what we do a lot of times. We come to 1 Samuel 17, and we immediately begin to uh, apply this scripture to our lives as this. What giant are you facing? As I'm going to say, it's bad application. It's great application. But let's just be remember, this is a real battle that David faced. And this was a real man that he went up against. And, and, I, I, and, I, and I heavily doubt that David standing in the valley of Elah is looking across at that physical giant named Goliath. And he's thinking, well, you know, this reminds me of that, of that spiritual giant I've been facing in my life back down in Bethlehem. <laughs> right? And, and this, is just, this is just symbolic of me going against him. It's great application. But, friend, this really took place. This was a physical battle. That David had to fight in his life. David was a God-fearing man. 1 Samuel 17. We see the Philistines are gathered. Their forces, verse 1, for war at Soko and Judah. They camped between Soko and Azekah and Ephes and uh, Damon. And Saul and the men of Israel had gathered together to camp in the valley of Elah. I don't know if you've ever been in the valley of Elah, but I've been there. You, you're, you're standing here. There are rolling hills on this side. There's a large valley that, that's between the two and, and hills on the other side. And so David and the armies of Israel have come over this side, and the Philistines have come over the, uh, over the hill on this side. They sleep behind these hills when they come out in the morning time, and they shout their taunts at each other. And so we see here, listen, verse number three, the Philistines were standing on one side of the hill, just like I just told you. The Israelites are standing on the other hill with a ravine between them. And then a champion. I mean, don't you, aren't you amazed that the Bible calls David in chapter 16 an eloquent warrior, but here in verse 17, it calls Goliath a champion. This means Goliath is undefeated, right? He's never been slain on the battlefield. This is the man you did not want to go up against. A champion named Goliath from Gath. He came out from the Philistine camp. He was nine feet, nine inches tall. And he wore a bronze helmet and bronze scale armor that weighed 125 pounds. There was bronze armor on his shin. And a bronze sword was swung between his shoulders and, and, and his... Cut off the microphone. I think my battery just went dead. There was bronze armor on his shins and bronze sword was slung between his shoulders and his spear shaft was like a weaver's beam. And the iron point of his spear weighed 15 pounds. In addition, a shield bearer was walking in front of him. Now, let me pause right here to see. My microphone went out, and I'm a wonderer. So I'm going to do my best to talk loud. If not, um, my brother can come get this microphone from me, and uh, we're going to get this thing plugged back up. And we're going to come right back on that. But I will talk to this in the meantime. Thank you, brother. Now, we talk about the fight or flight syndrome. This is the point where Zach Wim throws away, right? Here comes the giant, and he's got all this armor on. This is the point where I'm, I'm hitting, hitting the road. I'm out of here. I'm not fighting this guy. But I'm David. What's the Bible say? Verse 9. Goliath stood, and he shouted to the Israelite battle formations. Why do you come out and line up in battle formation? He asked Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose one of your men and have him come down against me. If he wins in a fight against me and kills me, we'll be your servants. But if I win against him and kill him, then you'll be our servants and serve us. And then the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel today. Send me a man so we can fight against each other. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words from the Philistine, they lost their courage and were terrified. I mean, that would be me. I would certainly be terrified in this moment if I was seeing this man for the very first time. And then we see this little part about David that we mentioned a moment ago. David has come down. His daddy's sitting down with the bread and the cheese. 
And we see that he runs the battle formation. So we're not going to read all that again. And then we see what happens to the one who's going to kill the Philistine, as I've already read to you. And then we see that part where David and his brother, his brother's fighting against him, are saying those things to discourage him. But now look at verse 29. So this is going on. The Philistine is out there. He's ready to fight. He's looking for anybody to fight him. And David asked his brother, what have I done now? It was just a question. And then he turned from those beside him to others in front of him and asked about the offer. And the people gave him the same answer as before. When David said, what David said was overheard and reported to Saul. So he and David brought to him and David said to Saul, don't let anyone be discouraged by, by him. Now this is David speaking. Now listen to this. Listen to what he says. Don't let anyone be discouraged by that giant. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. Saul replied, you can't go fight this Philistine. You're just a youth. And he's been a warrior since he was young. And David answered Saul, your servant has been tending his father's sheep whenever a lion or bear came and carried off a lamb from the flock. I went after it. I struck it down and I rescued it from the lion's mouth. If it reared up against me, I would grab its back fur and strike it down. I mean, David was tough, right? I mean, listen, I live in the mountains of North Carolina. And I'm a runner. I'm a long-distance runner. So every day, I go run. I got up this morning. I ran this morning at 4.30. I love to run. Well, when I moved to North Carolina, everybody's got me convinced that there are man-eating bears in the woods of the mountains. <laughs> and that you have to be extremely cautious when you're running. Like, I, I'm thinking that there's these... These bears in the woods that are just ready to reach out and grab a little runner off the side of the road and devour him because they love me. All right, so two Saturdays or three Saturdays ago, I'm running, and I've always told my wife, like, look, if I ever see one, as long as I see it in the distance, it's no big deal. I'm running along, running along about nine miles in, I come around the corner, and there stands a stinking black bear right here at that wall in front of me. And I stopped. And I'm going to tell you something. That is a big animal, right? And you don't really realize how big they are until you're standing in the wild with one. I mean, when they're behind the fence at the zoo, it's no big deal. But now he's in front of me. It's a scary thing. Let me tell you what I wasn't going to do. I wasn't going to grab him by the fur. <laughs> David, what's the Bible say? David, it says, when they would rear up against me, I would grab it by its fur. Not just a bear, but a lion. And I would kill it. Your servant has killed lions. Your servant has killed bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. And listen to what he says. For he has defied the armies of the living God. When David looked at Goliath, he wasn't afraid of Goliath. David had a fear of God. And David knew somebody's got to stand up for God. David knew to not stand up for God would forever bring reproach and shame to his name. And as we look through the Bible, friends, we find over and over and over again men who feared God. Men who did not fear the physical realm of men. We think about men like Joshua and Caleb. And you remember the story. They've been sent out to scout out the land. Twelve, one representative from each tribe of Israel. They go out, they get to the land, and they see giants in the land. Ten of those spies say, we cannot go forward. We cannot do what God has told us to do because we will never defeat them. They're too large. They're too big. They're too angry. They will devour us. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. Except for Caleb and Joshua. Caleb and Joshua, they bring back the report. Hey, we can, we can take them down. Because we're fighting with God on our side. And he has told us to go into this battle. And to not go into this battle is disobedient. And so yes, it may cost some of our lives. But we would rather stand for God than stand for nothing. We think about Elijah. Elijah knew that King Ahab had the power, the authority to issue a death sentence against him and cut off his head. But Elijah goes to Ahab and he looks at Ahab in the eyes and he says, by the word of the Lord, it will not rain in this land except by my command. 
And you've got to understand that the God that Ahab worshipped is what's known as the, as the fertility God, Baal. And so it was believed that Baal was the giver of rain. And so now Elijah's standing before the king and he says, it will not rain in the land because you worship a false idol. And although you might cut off my head, God has sent me down here to tell you that he's the God of Israel and it's only by him that it's going to rain. David, or Elijah feared God more than feared Ahab. When we get down to Jeremiah, we remember that Jeremiah is thrown into a cistern. And that man has told him, Jeremiah, you shut up preaching repentance and you shut up prophesying and don't you say another word about it. And Jeremiah goes through this, this battle on the inside and he, he says, you know, Lord, I don't understand why you strike me down. I don't understand why you afflict me. I don't understand why I'm in this place. But I know this. If I say that I will not speak in your name and I say that I will not let your word come out of my mouth, your word becomes like a fire burning down in my bones and I have to to get it out. He feared God more than he feared man. We think about Daniel, who was told, you cannot worship any God other than the king. And if you do, you will be tossed into the lion's den. And what did Daniel do? When Daniel heard the decree, Daniel went into his house. He went to the third floor of his house. He went over to the window. He opened up the window. He got down on his knees and he prayed out so that everybody in town could hear him praying. Why? Because he knew the God of heaven. And he wanted to be obedient to him and he feared him more than he feared the lion's mouth. And what happened? When he went in that night and they threw him into the lion's den, what happened? The next morning, the king comes and he opens the, the, uh, the cave and the den. And guess what? Daniel's alive. And he says, Daniel, how is it that you live? And he said, the God that I serve delivered me. He came and stood before me. Now, friends, I want you to know something. Lions eat in the dark. And a lion's den is dark. They're predators of the night. It's not that Daniel was able to hide in there. No, he said the Lord sent his angel and he stood before me. This is what I believe. I believe the moment they rolled the stone over the front of that den, I believe the light came on because the angel of the Lord stood before him. And I believe all night long those old lions laid down and that Daniel was on the other side having a worship service. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you don't bow down and worship the golden idol, you will be cast into the fiery furnace. What would it have cost Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to have just bowed down? Everybody else did. You don't know their names. You don't know who they are. You don't know where they come from. They all bowed down today. You don't know anything about any of them. So what would it have cost? Just to bow down one time to an idol. Big deal, right? The trumpet blast. Everybody goes down, but them three boys just stand up tall. Why? Because they feared God more than they feared Nebuchadnezzar. We can say this all the way to Jesus. Jesus prays in the garden, Lord, it be possible. Allow this cup to pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. What was Jesus afraid of in that moment? Was he afraid of the Romans? No, he wasn't afraid of the Romans. Was he afraid of a nail that was going to be put into his, into his, into his hands? No, he wasn't afraid of nails. Why? Because he's the creator of the heavens and the earth. He's the one who made the elements that would make the nails that go into his hand. He could speak the words and they would melt. He could call down 12 legions of angels, the Bible says. He wasn't afraid of man. He wasn't afraid of, of, of the wood. He wasn't afraid of the nails. He wasn't afraid of the whip. He was afraid of none of those things. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. Let this cup pass from me. What's that cup? The cup is the wrath of God being poured out on sinners of the earth. And Jesus knew he was going to have to drink it to the dregs. He was going to drink it until there was no drop left. And he was going to do it for you and me. That's what he was afraid of. And yes, he could have walked away. Yes, he could have called 12 legions of angels and come down off the cross. Sure, he could have. He feared God more than he feared man. 
Think about a person in Rwanda who was faced with this dilemma. He was the only Christian in his village. And he was told, renounce Jesus, renounce your faith, or tomorrow you will be beheaded. He refused. And the very next morning they cut off his head. That afternoon they went into his house where he had been held prisoner, or his jail cell where he had been held prisoner. And he sketched the following words on the wall the day before he died. I am a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished and I'm done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, chintzy giving, and dwarf goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, positions, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I now live by presence, learn by faith, love by patience, live by prayer, labor by power. My pace is set. My gate is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way is rough. My companions are few. My God is reliable. My mission is clear. I cannot be bought. I cannot be compromised. I cannot be deterred, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must go until heaven returns, give until I drop, preach until I'll know, and work until he comes. And when he comes to get his own, he will have no problem recognizing me because my colors have been made clear. I am unashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. For in it God's righteousness is revealed against all unrighteousness. First to the Jew and then to the Greek. I want to ask you a question. Do you fear God more than you fear man? Yesterday afternoon, I'm walking down the street, and I see this young Muslim girl standing in front of me. And she's got a little baby with her. And I'm about 10 steps behind her, and she's walking, walking, walking. She's heading to a park. And I'm prompted by the Holy Spirit of God to go speak to her. And I'm thinking to myself, number one, she'll never understand because I only speak English. Number two, this is, this is socially unacceptable in the Muslim culture for me to go talk to this girl. If I do this and her husband finds out, he's, he's liable to come after me. So I just can't do it. But then Jesus reminded me of John 4 and how he talked to a Samaritan woman. So I just walked up in that park and I looked at that Muslim girl in the face and I said, do you speak English? And she looked at me and me and with as plain as day, he said, yes, I do. Standing in that park after yesterday, I was able to share the gospel with her. But here's the thing, friends, why did I tell you that? I tell you that because my fear of God is greater than my fear of man. Are you man filled with fascination? Are you a God-fearing man? Thirdly, the spiritual warrior is a man of faith. A man of faith. What is faith? The Bible tells us in Hebrews, now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. Hebrews 11 and 1. We'll read that again. Now, faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. I think about my little son, Tucker Williams. We used to live in a house that had an island in the kitchen. And at the time, Tucker, he was like three years old. And I mean, it was a pretty sizable island, but, but he knew how to come up on the bar stools and he knew how to get up on top of that island. And so I'd just come walking through the house doing my business, and, and Tucker's on that island. And without saying a word and without warning, he would just jump and just expect that I would catch him before he hit the ground even though he didn't say anything to me even though he didn't warn me he was coming anyway expecting daddy to catch him isn't that a great illustration of faith faith is just stepping out into the unknown 
And the Bible tells us that the righteous will live by faith. Friends, if you're not living by faith, then you can't be declared righteous before God. It's by faith that you're saved. How are the Old Testament saints saved? By faith. It's always been by faith. They had faith in the coming Messiah. They were looking forward to him, believing that God was going to send him. And we have faith in the Messiah that has come. Salvation has always been by faith. No other way. By faith. By faith. David was a man of faith. All those men I mentioned a moment ago. Joshua, Caleb, Elijah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All men of faith. David, a man of faith. Everybody else is afraid, the Bible says. They all run away. They're all scared to face the giant. But what's the Bible say in verse 37? Then David said, the one who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the one who rescued me from the paw of the bear will be the one to rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. David knew that he hadn't defeated that lion and that bear on his own. He knew that it was God who had defeated it for him. And Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. And then Saul had his own military clothes put on David. He put a bronze helmet on David's head and he had him put on armor. And David strapped his sword on over the military clothes and he tried to walk, but he was not used to them. And he said, I can't walk in these. And David said to Saul, I'm not used to them. And so David took them off. Instead, he took his staff in his hand. And he chose five smooth stones. Some people would ask, why five, David? I mean, if David really had faith, why didn't he just take one? Well, a few things. It's been said that Goliath had four brothers, right? And one for Goliath and the other four for his brother. And I don't know if that's true or not. I just call it common sense. If I'm going into battle with a giant, I'm going to take five stones. The first might not kill him. I might have to take another one. Not a lack of faith. It's just common sense. Five smooth stones from the wadi. He put them in the pouch, in his shepherd's bag. And then with a sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Now, please understand, this is not your modern-day slingshot, okay? Just a little sling. Now, this is a sling. It's something you whip and whip and whip, and you sling that stone. One time on Mythbusters, they were doing this thing. Could David have really killed a man with a sling? They used a slingshot, of course, that is nothing. But when they used a sling like David slung, the rock that come off of that thing was going as fast as a bullet. And David is skilled at this. He's a shepherd. He does this daily. The Philistine came closer and closer to David. You can see this scene. David's marching. The Philistine's coming. And think of the difference. He's coming with all of his armor on. And what does David say later in the song? Some trust in chariots. Some trust in horses. But we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. He's coming with his chariots. He's coming with his horses. He's coming with his armor. But David's coming with nothing but sling and stone. And as the Philistine comes, he looks and he sees David. And he despised him because he's just a youth. You can hear David la or, or Goliath laughing under his breath. Who is this young man who comes against me? He says, am I a dog that you come against me with sticks? And he cursed David by his God. Come here, the Philistine called to David. I'll give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts. And then David looks back at the Philistine with full boldness and the fear of God in his eyes. And he says, what? You come against me with dagger. You come against me with spear. Spear, you come against me with sword. But I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel's army. You have defied him. And today, the Lord will hand you over to me. Today, I will strike you down. I will cut your head off and give the corpses of the Philistine camp to the birds of the sky and the creatures of the earth. And then all the world will know that Israel has a God. Two weeks ago, there was a big fight. Conor McGregor and Floyd May Mayweather. And, and before they fought, right, there was this big lead up. And the two of them would always be on the podium and they'd be shouting curse words at each other. I'm going to beat you. I'm going to beat you. Right? None of that was smack talk like David just did to Goliath. Right? I mean, he just lays it out there. Hey, I want you to know that by the time this is over, I'm going to cut off your head and I'm going to feed your body to the birds of the sky. Right? Man. 
I mean, this is, I mean, this is real faith. And this whole assembly will know that it's not by sword or by the spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's. He will hand you over to us. The battle is the Lord's, he said. I'm walking out here in faith, and there's nothing you can do to defeat me. You come against me with all the powers of the world, but I come against you in the name of the God of heaven. When the Philistines started forward to attack him, David ran quickly to the battle line to meet the Philistines. David put his hand in his bag. He took out the stone. He swung it. It hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead. He fell on his face to the ground. And David defeated the Philistine with a sling and a stone. And even though David had no sword, he struck down the Philistine and he killed him. By faith. By faith. Jesus said the faith of a mustard seed will move a mountain. And in this case, it moved a giant. I look back in my life as a pastor, probably one of the most profound things I've ever seen in my life. Two weeks into my pastor at Second Baptist in Great Falls, I'm coming out of the door, and there's a lady there named Anita Henson. And Anita looks at me, and she says, Zach, my, my granddaughter was born and her esophagus is, is not connected to her stomach. And so they've had to run uh, what they call a GI tube, I believe, directly into her stomach because she has to be fed through a bag. And tomorrow she's having her seventh surgery in order to try to get this problem fixed. So could you please pray for her? So the next morning I got up, I drove down to the hospital, prayed over this little girl. We left and we came home. Wednesday comes along and the girl's getting worse and worse and worse. They cannot figure out why, why she's getting sicker since they've done the surgery. Saturday comes, it's Saturday night, and 1 o'clock in the morning I get a phone call from a mama squalling crying on the other end of the phone. And she says these words, Zach, when the doctor did the surgery, he accidentally nicked Aurora's diaphragm and didn't seal it back up. And because of this, the inside of her body has become severely infected to the point when they cut her open, it looks like cauliflower inside of her. And they're giving her less than 24 hours to live. They have her on a helicopter right now going to Charleston. Can you please come? Well, this is 1 o'clock in the morning. Sunday morning services are coming in just a few hours. I'm sorry, I said, Amanda, I can't come right now. We have service in the morning, but as soon as it's over, I will be there. We get in the car, myself and Donald Funderburg, and we drive to Charleston. And when we get there, Amanda comes out to get us, and she says, I want you to know that when you come in the room, that Aurora has been cut open, and they've left her stomach open so they can clean out the infection, because it's just constant. They've got to continually go in there and clean it out every so often. Mama is lost, Amanda. Daddy is lost. Daddy is so afraid that he's not even in Charleston. He stayed back at home because he can't bear to see his daughter in this condition. Amanda takes me into this room, and I go back there, and here's this little Aurora Henson, two years old, little baby girl, laid out on the bed like this, tubes run all in her stomach wide open, infection and cauliflower, looking like cauliflower, all on the inside of her. A lost mama standing in front of me. And asking me this question, is my little girl going to be all right? Now, as I said a moment ago, Scripture has one meaning, many applications. You want to talk about a giant? Here's your giant. You want to talk about a mountain that needs to be moved? Here's the mountain that needs to be moved. And I'm a young pastor. I mean, this is a moment, friend. This is a moment that, hey, if you say it's going to be okay, it better be okay. Because if it's not okay, mama's never coming to Christ. So I looked across at Amanda with all the boldness in my heart, and I said, Amanda, I want you to know that your daughter is not going to stay in this hospital. God spoke into my heart standing right here, and she's going to get up. Now, if you want to say something like that, you better be sure that God really said it. We prayed over that little girl. I got home that day. I'm, I'm, guys, I'm human. 
Okay, I want you to know I'm a human just like you. I might be a pastor, I might be a preacher, God, but I'm human. I have my questions. I'm standing in my house and I'm thinking to myself, God, why in the world are you making that little girl go through that? No, I'm human. We all think stuff like that. Why in the world is this having to happen to her? Right at that time, the phone rings. A man's on the other end of the phone, sobbing, crying. He says, Marty Henson, Aurora's dead. I need you to come to my house right now. I need you to come. So I get in the car, drive down to Marty's house. I walk in the door. There sits broken daddy at his kitchen table, sobbing, weeping, crying. He looks at me and he says, I need to be saved. I need to be saved. So we prayed and Marty gave his life to Christ. Two days later, Aurora's still fighting, fighting for her life. Two days later, I get a phone call from Billy Henson, Aurora's uncle. Billy Henson said, Zach, I know you don't know me, but I need you to come to my shop. He owned a mechanic shop. He said, I need to talk to you about this stuff with Aurora. I don't quite understand it. So I go to this mechanic shop in the middle of July, and Great Falls is extremely hot. And I walk in there, it's probably 110 degrees in that shop, and this big, burly man, who is known as the toughest fighter in Great Falls, gets on his knees in the back of that mechanic shop and asks Jesus to save him. One day later, little girl still in the hospital fighting for her life, I get a knock at my door. Terry Henson, their brother, standing at my door, weeping, crying. I need answers. And sitting on my front porch, he gives his life to Christ. Less than a week later, Aurora is still fighting for her life. Uncle Donnie walks the aisle of the church and gives his life to Christ. And just a few weeks later, Aurora comes home from the hospital and today is a healthy fourth grader at Myrtle Beach Elementary School. Faith. Faith. The godly man, the characteristics of a spiritual warrior, a man filled fascination. A God-fearing man. A man of faith. Do you hold those characteristics today, Joan? In just a moment, you're going to be going into your rooms with your breakout sessions. And as you go into those breakout sessions, I'm asking you to examine your heart. Where do you live up in these points? Can you say today that you're filled with worship? Chaplains, ask those men. Ask them when the last time, when was the last time these men were filled with the awestruck wonder of God? When was the last time they truly just gave their heart and life and everything they were to worship Him? When I think about last Sunday morning, I went out to run, and when I go out to run, it was 4.30 in the morning, and man in the mountain, the stars were shining so bright. And there coming right across the valley of the Linville Gorge was Orion, the constellation. And I stood there filled with awe and wonder and just smiled as he just, just overflowed in anointing oil of his presence in my life. Are you a God-fearing man? Chaplains, ask those men, when was the last time you were faced with a dilemma? Where's man or God? It might have been a situation of witness. It might have been a situation in the home. It might have been a situation with, with, with another soldier. Where the reputation of God was on the line and you had to make a choice. Whether or not you were going to step into battle for the Lord or you were going to cower down in fear and run away from him. Chaplains, ask those men, where, where's your faith at today? Is your faith in the weapons of, of earthly warfare? Or is your faith in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? And ask them as well what they're doing to beat the enemy out of the gate we talked about this morning. I don't know about you, but I want to be a godly man. I want to have the characteristics of a spiritual warrior. And I pray you do as well. Father, we come before you this afternoon. And, and thank you for this message, Lord. I, I've been listening as you've been preaching. And Lord, you've done a work in my heart through this message this morning. What I need. 
I'm praying for these men, Lord. Spiritual warriors, it's what they are. It's what we all are. We're about to go into a time of small group breakout session. I pray, God, for transparency. I pray for open, honest discussion. That none of these men will be afraid to say what's truly on their heart. Because it's only then that we know that you'll really be able to move. As they come back into this room in just a little bit after they've got their stomach full and they come back in and we're preparing for one more session. Probably of all the things that we've talked about, probably going to be the one sermon that is the most challenging of them all. Because it's going to cause us to get real with you. I'm praying God that you'll begin now to speak into their lives. Speak into their heart. Begin to turn toward you. So you might do a great and mighty work in Lord, I don't know what Willie has prepared to sing, but I'm just, I'm just going to step over here and have a seat. Lord, I'm not even going to ask the chaplains to come right now. We know who they are. They're scattered through. Everybody just kind of has their head bowed and their eyes closed. Willie's going to play. This altar's open for you. When he finishes playing this song, we're going to go to our breakout session. This will be your benediction, this song. Just allow the Lord God is speaking to you a lot. Search your heart. See if you're living up to the characteristics of a godly man. I pray that you are, friends. Father God, we love you. We praise you. We'll listen. We pray. If you need a chaplain, feel free to get up and move to one. If you need to talk to me, feel free to come grab me by the hand. If you need to pray, Come pray. You just take time with the Lord this morning.